Good morning. Um, it really is an honor to be here. Um, I'm a little confused as to exactly what's happening and how long we've got and so on, but I'm sure we'll sort it out as we go along. Maybe I could just say a few words of general introduction. First of all, having said it's an honor to be here, I really am pleased for Oman that Oman has been adapted to a regional center for the Arab community. My true loves in life, other than being the UK, are Malaysia and this region here, and I've worked very closely with both of them. As I think it's been explained, I'm a director of a program in the UK producing an MSc in information security, and we have had over 100 graduates from the Middle East in either PhDs or uh, MSCs. So I feel I belong. Um, my connections with Malaysia are well known. I'm a very strong supporter of IMPACT and ITU, and I support the vision, which is to bring up the level of information security on. everywhere. And I think this initiative is great. Um, the program today is um, extensive and very impressive. Of course, the topics are not disjoint. There will be considerable overlap. Um, I'm very grateful to Kevin for giving this excellent impromptu keynote, which I think found stimulating and very impressive, especially as it prepares at such short notice. Um, I think, more or less, I don't think I want to say anything else. I think my role is nothing more than to facilitate the panel discussion. We have on the panel a distinguished panel from IMPACT, ITU, and Oman. I think the panel discussion should go along the lines of what is a regional center, why Oman, what's it going to do, and how's it going to do it? And so in that respect, I have no, nothing to do other than introduce the panelists. Um, do you have an agreed order? Are you happy to go first? So the, the first panelist is um, Howlin Zell, who's Deputy General Secretary for ITU, has been re-elected twice to the position, so he's well established and so on. And I'll, I'll leave it to him to just say the IT's role in this whole process. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Do you want to stand here? Like a, huh? Do you want to come here? <laughs> Do you like? <laughs> then I can sit down. <laughs> I have my. That's right. Okay. okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a real pleasure to be with you here this morning at this uh, very important uh, conference. Uh, I, I have to correct a little bit uh, our master. He, he said I was uh, re-elected two times, actually. Uh, to, be, to be accurate, uh, I was uh, a director of uh, Standardization Bureau of ITU in 1998, then was re-elected in 2002 for my second term. Then in 2006, I was elected as Deputy Secretary General, and in 2010, I was re-elected. Oh, According to IT rules, for one position, any individual can only be re-elected once. But if to the other position, it's another seat. Uh, as you perhaps know that uh, IT is uh, one of the UN agency, but IT is an uh, old international organization, created in 1865. So this year, we were celebrating our 148 university uh, anniversary. And you might have noted that the ITU from the very beginning uh, contributed to the standard setting process to make uh, international communication system working. So someone said that without ITU, you know, that uh, today nobody can enjoy the telecommunication services today. I think that is absolutely true. But we noted that uh, over the last uh, two decades, that the new telecommunication services, such as the mobile, such as the internet, already come to our life. And just recently, I think last week, uh, Secretary General of ITU, Dr. Amanatoy, announced at the Barcelona uh, Global Mobile Conference that we expected by the end of this year, the world will have about 6.8 billion mobile subscriptions. So among 7.1 billion population, it's almost everybody we have one. Of course, that is uh, statistics, mathematical calculations. 
And if you consider you know, any individuals who may have more than one mobile phone, so that uh, still in the world we have a lot of people who are not connected by mobile phones. But as far as the internet is connected, uh, connection is concerned, and we found that uh, today about 30% of populations are online, which means two thirds of the population still are not connected. So nowadays, we just heard about uh, very, very good uh, stories about uh, cyber, cyber attack, cyber security issues from our moderators. And I, this morning, I had a very good discussion with uh, the owner of a conference, Excellency, the Minister of Health. And he told me that uh, in Oman today, they already have a lot of paperless process that uh, for even for the patient and the doctors, they don't need to, 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 to have paper. So someone you know, considered the doctor and then went to the pharmacy to get his uh, medicine without uh, showing this paper. So if anything is wrong with ICD system, so the patient may get the wrong medicine. That uh, could be a very serious issue. But if you think about uh, operation in the hospitals, and a doctor heavily rely on the iPad information, and something wrong there, it's not only the money problem, it's a problem of uh, life. And I, I also noted that from our previous uh, uh, speaker, he mentioned that uh, today, you know, this uh, problem is real. It's uh, becoming more and more difficult to, 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 to you know, to uh, protect ourselves from these uh, cyber attacks because the hackers do not worry, do not have any concern of uh, getting caught. And that is a problem for us. So I do you know, put this uh, cyber security highly on its agenda that uh, we launched a program called uh, Global Cybersecurity Agenda. And we had uh, worked with uh, experts from the uh, private sector and from government officials uh, to develop uh, the strategies. And uh, with this uh, Global Cybersecurity Agenda, we look at uh, several issues, such as uh, legal measures, technical measures, organization measures, and capacity building measures and international cooperation. And we worked with uh, UN agencies such as the UN ODA, with private sectors, many sector members with many industries, and we also worked with NGOs to develop the global cyber security agenda. And uh, you might have heard noted that uh, December last year in Dubai, we developed, uh, we agreed with the new International Telecommunication Treaty. There, there is a big topic about the security and the robustness of the networks. Unfortunately, there was some misunderstanding that if ITU look at this security issue of the network, that means we, ITU try to step in to take over the internet governance. I think that is an unfortunate misunderstanding. It took us a lot of time to clear the unnecessary misunderstanding. And finally, I'm very pleased to note that at Dubai, the majority of the countries presented at the meeting signed that uh, treaty, which contains very important topics on the security and robustness of networks. Because today, we just heard that, you know, that uh, we are all connected by mobile phones. And many people are connected by internet, almost everywhere. But security is a big concern of us, and it's hard to, to get those criminals be caught. So we need some international framework. But here we have uh, also problems that, uh, you know, if you look at the, the cyber crime or cyber attack, in some countries may not consider that seriously a criminal, criminal actions. But for the others, maybe it's quite serious. So it's not very easy to, to find those uh, criminals, and it's not easy to bring them to the justice. So we understand that. It's not only the problem of uh, technical 
or engineers you know, who, who, who can help us to solve this problem. Uh, we need the international family to work together. So ITU realized that. And then IIT developed a new program. We call it uh, Child, Child Online Protection, COP. And we understand that uh, very, very sensitive of this issue at the international level. But we consider that everybody would agree that we have to protect our children from online criminals, such as pornography. You know, that everybody will accept the same standard everywhere in the world. But still, here we still have some, some problems, so we have to work, work uh, you know, continuously. And we already have some progress. But as far as uh, the cyber attack is concerned, I think that uh, we also made a very good progress. And we engaged the impact that to Armin will give us more information. Now we established uh, cooperation with them. And we have a very good program. And uh, today, I think the city is completely different from five years ago or four years ago when we started the project. That a lot of people suspect that this is the really right direction. But today, we are very pleased to know that 145 countries already signed, confirmed their commitment to support this program, join this program. I think that that too will give us more information about that. So we are very pleased that uh, not only in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, where that uh, uh, global uh, cyber attack warning system in service now, but we also yesterday found the first regional center opened in Oman. So we are very, very pleased with this development. Of course, we will continue our efforts to work with impact to see another region, such as Africa, to set up a similar regional center. But of course, our global center, our regional center, if we do not have a good connection with the national centers, it will not be that powerful. And if we do not have an international agreed platform, agreed guidelines, it will also not be easy for us to really to chase those criminals or hackers to protect ourselves from this cyber attack. So ladies and gentlemen, I think that uh, our panel is, uh, is uh, very, very important to have uh, overall pictures of the cyber uh, security situation at the global level and the regional level and even national level. But I think that we don't have much time. So I don't want to take too much of, uh, of your precious time to, to, to stay here too long. So I'd like to hand over to my, my, my master. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think what we'll do is we'll have the three panel speakers all stay in what they want to say, then throw it open to questions afterwards. The next speaker is Datuk Mohd Amin, who's a personal friend and chair of Impact. I, I say no more. His Impact success is due to his leadership. So over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Fred, for your kind words. Uh, excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I would like to touch a little bit uh, on cybersecurity and the role that IMPACT and ITU plays, and also to explain a little bit about the role of the regional center. As you know, yesterday the, the physical center was formally launched uh, the, by the Deputy Secretary General and the uh, Minister of Oman. Uh, it was a very impressive center, but premises and impression, premises alone does not make for effectiveness. So I would like to actually say a little, a little bit about what can be done, what can be effectively managed by the center and our hope and aspirations. But before that, I had a very interesting uh, question that was asked to me uh, yesterday. Uh, the question was, why does the United Nations and ITU need to look into cybersecurity? What is so important? There's so many other pressing matters in the world today. Well, I'm glad that the speaker before us had actually explained in quite detail the implications of cyber threats. It does not just mean the inconvenience of 
not getting your email. That's not important. But today, as societies, as infrastructure, critical infrastructure, mind you, are being wired up around the world, it is very possible for those who are intent on causing harm to be able to even cause loss of life, no longer economic loss, but actual physical loss of life uh, to result in casualties by just using computer networks. So hypothetically, a group of terrorists could do much damage without even having to set foot in your territory, without having to use bombs and bullets. We foresee this, we foresaw this a couple of years back, and the United Nations um, and, uh, and its sister agencies like the ITU, uh, I think that part of the charter is to resolve the problems of humanity. Uh, if you look, a good example that we've always talked about is the spread of infectious diseases. It is similar to cyber threats. It is borderless. Uh, a, a disease can spread from uh, China to Malaysia to Oman. It doesn't recognize borders. Uh, cyber threats too are the same. But when it comes to actual human diseases, the response of governments and the related parties are much, much better than in the response to cyber threats. Let's give you an example. If tomorrow there is a spread of the Ebola virus from Africa, immediately an advisory will be issued by the UN sister agency concerned, the WHO, for instance, on how countries should screen passengers coming from these affected regions at airports, at seaports, for instance. Uh, there is an established procedure. This did not come by accident. It came because of close coordination between the UN, between uh, the agencies concerned, between the governments and between the industry. And similarly, at the back end, the pharmaceutical houses will be working together with uh, organizations like Center for Disease Control to actually find ways to mitigate the threats. Now, let's focus to cyber threats. Why can't this kind of cooperation be emulated by governments of the world, by countries? And this is what we are trying to do. At ITU, uh, when um, the global cybersecurity agenda was launched back in 2008, um, IQ and IMPACT join forces. Today, we are the cybersecurity executing arm on behalf of the ITU to deliver services uh, to all of ITU's 193 member states. And part of our mission is to create a platform to enable governments to come together, but not just governments, also major industries. Some of the people you see at the, at the back are actually our industry partners uh, to give a very a uh, very real example, uh, earlier, a few months back, when the uh, major flame virus uh, was discovered, um, the United Nations, and ITU in particular, I would say, um, was alerted, and uh, we, together with IMPACT, we worked with our industry partners, and we were able to come up with remediation tools. Uh, and this was the first time that a UN cyber alert was issued for cyber threats. Uh, and it came not just with an alert, but it came with remedial tools, with instructions on what um, countries and administrations should do uh, to check whether they are infected, and if they are, what steps to take. So there's already a beginning of, if you like, a system or process uh, to enable countries, governments, and industry to work together. Uh, and this could not have come without the foresight and leadership of the ITU. I know the ITU, um, uh, particularly the Secretary General, uh, Dr. Toure, uh, the Deputy Secretary General, Mr. Zhao, has been very, very active, even when people were not talking about cybersecurity a couple of years back. They were already thinking about this. And together with IMPACT, we are very, very happy today that we have almost two-thirds of the UN membership who are part of this coalition. And this coalition, as I mentioned, does not just group together governments of the world, but also industry and academia. People like uh, our chairman today, Professor Fred Piper, uh, who is an academician and a well-respected cryptographer, uh, has been on the Impact Advisory Board since day one. And we have many others who are, who are on the advisory board. Also, Impact and ITU has, fought, has made a strategic decision to work with our counterparts in other areas. 
we have recently, uh, last November, signed a very strategic agreement with the Interpol. I see my colleague, Mr. Nakatani, is here. He will be able to tell you some of the things that Interpol is doing. Uh, and it's an ecosystem. Uh, today, to solve a cybercrime, you cannot just have the police, you cannot just have the ISPs, you cannot just have the telecoms regulators. Everyone needs to work together, including the judiciary and the prosecution offices. So we're trying to do this at, at international level, at regional level, and at national level. Now, the second question I got uh, earlier today was, what is expected of the uh, regional center? I do not want to speak more uh, in detail about this because Mr. Bada will be able to tell you some of these uh, details of what his plans are. But from the ITU impact perspective, what we like about the concept of the regional center, which came about last year, was that it enables us to come closer to the region that we want to service. There is a tremendous need to localize some of the services that we offer to countries around the world. And this is because of time differences, uh, cultural differences, language differences. The, uh, the Oman Center will be an extension of ITU Impact's um, hands and resources in this region. And by doing so, we think that we will be able to enhance our services. Um, we were very happy that um, Oman had the backing, the strong backing of many of your neighboring countries here to, be, to host this regional center. This was very important to uh, ITU Impact because obviously a regional center needs to have the support of the region. And we're very happy even looking at the uh, participants today that there are many, many uh, delegates who are from uh, other countries around this region who represent the governments and also the industry. So I think this will bode well. And uh, I'll be happy at the end, Fred, to answer any question that may arise. In it. For, for now, I will take my leave and uh, I shall give it the floor back to you. Okay. As you may have deduced, there's been a slight change to the panel. The, the third member now is Badia Al Sahi, who is director of Oman CERT and to me, the, the CERT is slightly a misnomer. It doesn't do them credit because it's really the center of excellence for cybersecurity in Oman. Mm, thank you. Okay. Very good morning, everyone. First of all, on behalf of the organizers, the IT would like to apologize on the change that has been made to the agenda this morning. Unfortunately, due to unfor seasons and uh, commitment and change in the schedule of His Excellency the Minister, we had basically to change the program a little bit. However, basically, I'm not going to really talk much. Uh, I'm not going to talk after the uh, keynote we had this morning. I think that justify enough the need of having a regional cooperation. Uh, cooperation is very important. The regional center is going to basically facilitate this cooperation amongst uh, the member countries in the region. Uh, ITU Impact, uh, as we all know, has already addressed cybersecurity on a global level. The global cybersecurity agenda issued by the ITU addressing the five main pillars, which is uh, uh, the legal aspects, the organizational structure, the capacity building, as well as the technical and procedural measure and the international cooperation. Uh, we have also seen today's on Dr. Salem's speech and few other speeches that the World Summit and Information Society that took place in Tunisia as well as the one took place in Geneva has already emphasized on the importance of building security and confidence on the use of ICT. Now with all the statistics we have seen, whether on the significant development of the number of ICT users as well as again the significant increase in the number of cyber threats and incidents, this would definitely require that we all get together to understand or to work together basically to see how we could uh, come closer in sharing our experiences, sharing our uh, competences that every country has. Uh, I'm sure that every country has a unique experiences in certain areas of cybersecurity. Cybersecurity covers uh, different elements and domains. So basically the purpose of having this panel discussion today is not really to share with you as much information as we expect you to ask and seek. We have here like the representative of ITU, the impact, which is the cybersecurity executing arm that are going to extend their support and services to the regional center. And it happens that 
uh, Professor Fred to moderate this panel discussion where we were having a chat yesterday. He says, just like I am, just like any one of the other participants, I would like to know more about the regional center. What is it going to do? What are the services that's going to be provided? I might briefly address those, like in general, what is it that the regional center is going to do? But it is really an opportunity that for all of you to raise your question, not only to Oman uh, being host in the regional center, but even to inquire about the ITU services, the impact commitment, just to understand how much commitment that all of these three organizations are paying to the information security. So basically the regional center for the time being, the, the, the scope is, this is how we're going to start, the scope is going to focus on the Arab region. And I have to emphasize uh, that the center is not really an Oman center. This is a center that belongs to the all uh, Arab region. I would like here again to extend the appreciation mentioned by Dr. Salem to all Arab countries that were actually supporting these initiatives. And we do appreciate their uh, support even in hosting the center of Oman. So basically we will have to work together as the Arab region to ensure that uh, the, uh, the services that's gonna be delivered out of this center gonna meet the uh, regional requirement uh, it uh, meets the regional uh, concerns on cybersecurity. We all understand that uh, the Arabic language is a common language within the Arab uh, region where we uh, have um, a good number of basically uh, ICT users that are using the Arab uh, language even on non-Arabic uh, platforms or social media. The statistics mentioned by Dr. Salem, uh, the Arabic language has grown 2,500% over the last decade, which means the usage of this language is going to extend and extend. So without really having to say much on that, the services that the regional center is going to focus on is the capacity building as a first priority. There are going to be a number of workshops, conferences, specialized training with the support of the experts of ITU and IMPACT to address certain aspects of information security and cybersecurity. We're going to be basically helping those countries. We've seen the statistics, 8 out of 22 from the Arab states that already have an active search. So the, an extension of the services already provided by IMPACT will be provided by the regional center to help the Arab states that do not have yet a cert to establish it. We'll be also conducting and running a number of simulated cybersecurity exercises that we tend to call cyber drills. This is basically to evaluate the readiness for those certs that already exist and also to make uh, the other uh, countries aware of how to handle a, a simulated cyber attack. There will be few other services focusing on the child online protection. As we are all aware, the ITU has already issued a guidelines and working on a strategy basically on child online protection where we all believe that the majority of the ICT users are those that uh, are considered to be young and definitely children uh, are considered to be uh, kind of uh, uh, taking a good percentage out of that. There will be a few other services also focusing basically on uh, technical measures and technical solutions that has to be implemented in order to combat cyber threats. At this point of time, I would like to hand it over to Professor Fred, but we would really appreciate to have the interaction from the audience as well as the question to be addressed to us from Professor Fred. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Now I think it's time for the panel questions to start. Excuse me, just one minute. I just, Kevin, would you like to come up? Because there wasn't time for questions to your keynote. So I'd like to add you to the panel. And, sorry. <laughs> but if there are any questions, I think you should, they should have a chance to answer them. Now, in theory, the theory is that I will, you either direct your questions directly one of the panel, or I direct it for you. If your question is in English, I will be able to do that. There's a gentleman with his hand up there. Go ahead, please. There's a microphone somewhere? Yes, do take my seat at the end there. I'll stand here. Hi, good morning. Hello. My name is Assam Hadi. I'm from Bahrain, Aluminium Bahrain. Uh, thanks for being invited to attend this conference. Uh, I've got quite few questions. Can I ask them all? I have to, or I have choice of one. So, well, ask one, <laughs> and then each time someone else gets in with another question, ask another. Okay, that's great. Okay, prioritize I think, them. Yeah, thanks a lot. 
Uh, actually, I have a question for each one of them, so I will start with the ITU. Uh, basically, it's good to know about that. ITU have established the, the region here and been able to sign the treaty. The question was to me, who are the countries that basically have signed the ITU treaty and are for us to know about it? Because the truth is, I don't know anything about that. And second thing is that, who we can actually protect us as a companies or key connected to that. The problem, so, so the problem is that, I'm trying, okay. So the problem is that if you look at the, currently the issues is with organizations and with individuals. ITU at the moment when it comes looks at what really because if I look at organization, that's one thing organization have services, have things to pay for this kind of thing in order that treaty can handle it. But what our people, who will handle the people, individuals, like what you said, children, our kids who uses everything. Now that's one of the question about ITU and roles and the treaty, please. Uh, is that clear or am I? <laughs> I hope the answer doesn't take as long. <laughs> you want me to answer? Yes, please. Yeah, thank you very much for your good question. Uh, as I mentioned, that uh, we had uh, our big conference uh, in Dubai December last year to revise our international telecommunication regulation. The previous one, or actually still valid one, was approved in 1988, November, Melbourne. You can, you can imagine, this is obsolete, because uh, 1988, we did not know mobile. We do not know internet. So the situation is completely changed. 1988, that uh, regulation was based on fixed line networks. So distance, time, and uh, price, all these are big concerns of operators and administration. And at that moment, in most uh, members of the world, the telecommunication is a government of service. It's not. Uh, commercial service uh, open for the public competitions in the market. So the situation today is completely ch changed. Therefore, our IT members really uh, pushed to modify this uh, regulation. And we were successful last December to get the new ITU telecommunication regulation. We call it ITR. At that moment, we had uh, 89 countries on site signed this treaty. I'm very pleased to note that all GCC countries, all Arabic countries, have signed that, except perhaps, for example, Syria, because Syria was not uh, actually participated at that meeting. And the uh, majority of developing countries from Africa, I think that the most of them signed except those who did not participate, except uh, one for particular reasons, like Kenya, but all the others already signed. And in Asia, Pacific, most countries signed. So the countries who did not sign actually was, uh, you know, United States and uh, European countries. And the United States had uh, some kind of uh, feeling that uh, because we introduced this security issue and the uh, robustness of networks issue in this new treaty. They worried that uh, perhaps IT try to use this as some kind of step to try to take over the internet governance. And we tried very hard, Secretary General from the very beginning clarified that it's not ITU's intention to do that. And we even invited the chairman of uh, ICON to come to our meeting during the first day to make some kind of statement. So we did our best to try to clarify. And we all understand that the security of the networks is key to maintain international telecommunication services. If we do not have security, nobody trusts our networks. They cannot do that. And um, in my opinion today, of course, you know, uh, we cannot uh, really talk about the security of uh, fixed networks only, because our telecommunication business already covered mobile, internet. And uh, we, we heard uh, even f earlier this morning that uh, not only we have a very good uh, you know, penetration of uh, mobile subscriptions, but we also have uh, mobile access 
broadband access from mobile services. So this broadband access actually is also linked to the internet. Therefore, the security of the uh, internet is a uh, big concern of our members. And we, IT already started this work for a long time, as uh, just mentioned by, by my previous panel speakers, that uh, at the World Summit of Information Society, which were held in Tunis, November 2005, all members agreed to ask ITU to be the only facilitator to take care of uh, cybersecurity issues with one of the action, plan, action lines. So IT has uh, worked very hard. And I'm very pleased uh, to note that uh, the European countries, although they did not sign that one, but uh, they are thinking the way to, to accede. Because uh, according to IT uh, procedures, if you have not signed that one on site, then you cannot sign that anymore. But you can accede to this uh, treaty. And a lot of European countries, they are just uh, conducting their studies. I think that next week in Roma, Italy, there will be a very important meeting pushed by European telecom organization called Etno to have a debate. And the Secretary General of ITU and the FCC commissioners and the former, actually still, the ambassador of the United States for our wicked, all, be, all will be invited at that meeting to try to to, 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 to clarify the situation. I was very pleased to hear from uh, our senior expert from the uh, State Department of the United States that uh, although they have not signed this treaty, but they still continue to support ITU for their endeavor to do everything the members expect them to do. So that uh, situation, in my opinion, is quite, uh, quite good. And uh, for example, yeah, one of the African countries who have not signed that treaty is Mauritania. Because Mauritania delegate participated in that meeting did not have a credentials to, 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 to sign. But actually, the delegate got a credential to sign. But unfortunately, they missed the, the actual time to sign. So now they're contacting ITU to try to find a way to accept, accept to this one. So more and more, we are very, very confident. More and more countries will join us. And those uh, um, misunderstandings could be clarified. But uh, some of our European countries, some of our European countries, just uh, you know, have to pass their internal national consultation before they can sign this contract, uh, sign this uh, treaty. I'm pretty sure they will come back. They will, will accept. So that uh, we are very, very pleased with the result of this uh, uh, treaty. And this treaty, if you, if you look at this treaty, it's a very, very short uh, document. It's about uh, 10 pages. And the main provisions, only 10 provisions, four pages only. And throughout the treaty, you will not find any single word of internet. So the misunderstanding, misperception that IT want to use this to, 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 to take over internet governance, it's not true. But the main purpose of this treaty is try to encourage further investment in our telecom business. Because nowadays, there is a problem particularly our telecom operators, they have a very big trouble that uh, they need money to upgrade their services. For example, 3G to 4G. For example, the current uh, internet uh, access with, uh, with uh, normal speed to high speed broadband, they need money. They need a kind of, uh, some kind of investment and then return. But on the other hand, the customers all ask them to reduce their price. And the internet offer a lot of uh, free services, even without any charges. But the internet cannot be run without our operator's infrastructure. And who will take care of the infrastructure? So that infrastructure has to be invested by someone. It's not government anymore. It's a private. It's a market. So therefore, you know, that uh, those who invested in the infrastructure, you know, have to be encouraged to do so in the future. And our treaty, our telecommunication regulation, just try to encourage public and private investment in telecom business to continue to. Of course, you know that at our treaty, we have also talked about a new, new problem of roaming. This is not the case in 1988, but in 
at eight, no, no mobile service. Now the rooming is a big concern of uh, people. And a taxi, taxation. Maybe here it's, 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 it's not a problem. I heard that in Gulf uh, countries, okay. you don't may, uh, really pay tax. May I, but, uh, may, may I interrupt? Um, sorry, it's too long. <laughs> too long, too long, yes. I, <laughs> sorry I about you, that. I'd like to give other people uh, a chance. Very, very good, very questions. good, yes. Now, taxation is a very, uh, just let me just uh, finish. The taxation is a very big concern of many, many national operators. And some countries uh, give very heavy taxation. And we also discussed that. So that um, uh, treaty will be uh, very good uh, for us to, to, to encourage uh, okay. uh, further investment in the telecom market, in the ICT market. Thank you very much. Sorry, sorry. To, sorry to interrupt. <laughs> Any other, no, other questions? Other questioners? No, no, sorry. Other questioners before I go back to the... You have the floor, sir. It appears to be a discussion between you and the panel. Go ahead. Well, there is time. We, we, we'll carry on for a few minutes because we, we're running late. And so he just said no, no time. Okay, thank you very much, really. The other thing is that regarding the, when you talk about the Ebola virus, okay, it's not a case. The reason is that countries around the world, they want to protect their people. It's the other way around with viruses when you talk about network. reason is that Viruses being actually built could be by others to attack other countries to get the information from it. So the comparison to me was not that good. But if I look at it today, the issue is that if you talk about like Stuxnet, when we start develop, was basically to attack a specific infrastructure. Now till today, we don't see things coming up in order to protect us as industries against these kinds of things. So what impact will actually do on that area? Because Impact to me, it looks like an entity that it will protect everyone to help them. So what are you doing in that area? The importance of um, the analogy of using infectious diseases is to show that just because a threat is borderless and just because it affects everybody and uh, no one country or no one organization could handle it doesn't mean that we cannot do things to overcome together. And... Uh, in the case of um, Stuxnet, for instance, yes, um, by, by and large, it's been agreed by consensus that it is a state-sponsored uh, malicious wear. Uh, in cases like this, when countries uh, attack one another for a very specific purpose, uh, it's very, very difficult for anyone um, to actually put a stop to it, particularly if a huge amount of resources are being put. But in the case of Stuxnet flame, one big difference um, that has happened is that because the ITU and impact has now has got mechanism uh, around our different counterparts around the world to spread uh, alerts and advisories, we are able to do something. This is evident from the flame uh, virus, for instance, where remedial tools were being developed and were released even before public announcements were made to national administrations. Um, it is not, I wouldn't claim to say that we've reached the pinnacle of what we can do. We are far away from that, but we're slowly, build, we're slowly putting in the building blocks together to make it happen. And I think uh, if we have more of these building blocks involving not just governments, but industry working together, this will become a matter of course. It, um, just like how, uh, whenever, as I mentioned, whenever there's a spread of infectious diseases, countries, governments, and health authorities know what to do. Hopefully, in the time to come, with all these measures that we're taking, um, that governments, uh, industry, and authorities are able to respond in the same way when dealing with cyber threats. Fred, back to you. Can I ask one more? For the OSERT, yes. Yeah. Okay. Please do. Uh, thank you, actually, for giving this opportunity. The, on the third part, actually, I did really, I'm, I'm, I have to congratulate you for that because this is something good to do that region here. The question is what you just said, it's like a long-term solution or long-term plan for whatever. I think we are facing a big issue at the moment in this region. We need short-term plan, something immediately now on the ground in order to face these attacks and stop them. What is that kind of thing? And especially if you're looking in Oman, the work, what's happening with other GCs? Are you working with us? I mean, I come from Bahrain. I want to know really how that cooperation with Bahrain in order to be short-term for our industries. Kevin talked about SCADA. That's the, my nightmare. 
because we come from industry, which is we produce aluminum, and SCADA is the basically everything bit of my engine. So if that's kind of seeing everything on the site, and I'm not sure I have to check with Kevin how I can find about our company there, but what is the short-term plan immediately to fix all these things? Thank you. Okay, go ahead. <clears throat> okay, that is, a, that is a good question. And uh, fortunately, it is not as short-time um, action as probably it sounds. Uh, I mean, addressing cybersecurity in the region, whether in the GCC or in the Arab states uh, as a whole, has been already kind of taken place uh, years back. I mean, in 2008, just addressing it on the GCC level, uh, under the General Secretariat of the GCC, uh, a GCC CERT committee was established in 2008. And since then, I remember at that time, we had only uh, three to four countries that already had their national CERT. Fortunately, today we are only left with two that are already taking good steps, including Bahrain, as well as uh, the other remaining country from the GCC. Within this GCC CERT committee, in fact, we have been running a number of training workshops, running simulated cybersecurity exercises in order to ensure that we are building these capabilities. There are certain countries within, this, within the GCC that have even gone further with uh, protecting critical national infrastructure, and they have already issued policies on critical national infrastructure protection. In addition to this, when it comes to the Arab region, although at the same time of establishing the GCC, there were kind of a plan also to get the Arab countries together, the OIC CERT, uh, that is the Organization of Islamic Cooperation CERT, were also established in 2009, and it happened that all the Arab countries are actually a member of the OIC. This has also enabled the Arab countries basically with the uh, services that are already currently provided by the existing certs, and we have been again running uh, cyber drills, cyber security training, and workshops. Now, what is it that we are doing to mitigate those threats? Here, what are we doing? Apart from getting the, the, the teams ready, which is very important, I mean, we've been talking today, technologies, solutions are then, but humans are always, you know, the weakest factor in all of this uh, chain. So basically, we are focusing on not only building local capabilities to address cybersecurity within the CERTs or the national uh, cybersecurity centers, but we are even promoting cybersecurity awareness. And there have been several initiatives, not only within the government, but even within the public, within critical national infrastructure. In Oman, for instances, for the past two years, we have run a number of specialized work so, uh, workshops on SCADA security. In addition to that, we have tied up with a number of conference providers in the region that have already come up with a specialized uh, conferences on uh, energy sector, where we have even sponsored a number of our critical national infrastructure, as well as students at school, just to understand what is going on. I hope this very quickly address your question, as uh, I don't really want to take much uh, of time, but we can definitely address this during the break. Thank you. Can I ask last one? No, no, sorry. I, I'm under strict instruction. I'm strict instructions from the session chair that that must be the last question. Thank you all for your... I would just like to thank the panel very much. Thank you.